So good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about the global burden of disease. Uh, I want to show you some of our uh, What is GBD 2013, some of our key results. And I want to show you some data from the United States and end up with some recommendations. So GBD is a systematic scientific effort to uh, quantify in a comparative magnitude the health loss for every country in the world by age, by sex. So we have 188 countries, and we do it from 1990 to now. So it tells you, enables you to see what risk factors are changing, how mortality is changing. And in many countries right now, we're able to do it at the sub-national level where we could look at disparities within a country. We have 306 diseases and injuries and over 2,000 sequela that comes after this disease and 79 risk factors, which is the most important part of what we do. It's updated annually. It's a grant from uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We have so many risk factors, and it's hierarchical, so behavioral, environmental, and metabolic. And we go from diet, high body mass index, blood pressure, occupational exposure, environmental exposure, indoor cooking, uh, indoor exposure to harmful and then we have about over 1,000 collaborators in 108 country. We cannot do this ourselves at, uh, at IHME in Seattle, the University of Washington, without having people from each country telling us what data is available and helping us to do our product. So if you look at traditional metric, when we look at health, you have incidence, prevalence, and you have death numbers and rate. What we're doing with GBD, we're adding three different indicators of health. One is years of life loss. So Women in Japan lives up to 86 years. Anybody dying in the world, let's say at 70, that's 16 years of life lost. We expect everybody to live the same. We add them up for every country by age, by sex, of course. Years of lived on this, with disability would be somebody getting diabetes at age 60, for example, and he lived till 70, 10 years living with disability of diabetes. We add those up. So is it a disease? Until death or until remission, we add how much disability that disease has caused and that risk factors. And disability-adjusted life years is a sum of the two years of life lost, which was killing us, plus years lived on disability, what's ailing us, and it's a picture of health of the world, what's killing us and what's ailing us. It's so complicated, I don't want to spend a lot of time. There is a, a lot of things goes in. Uh, for example, number 12 here, there is a book about how we do number 12. We use satellite to get exposure for environment. We validate that when we have places, uh, measurements, local level. It gets even more complicated for us academic. But there is a lot of work goes in, lo a huge team at IHME, and then inter uh, a lot of collaborators working on this. This is beyond talk today. So let me go to the visualization and show you what I mean by what we have. So we have so many, visualiz so many visualizations at IHME, and one of them is, let me show the U.S. first. So this is the U.S. health map, for example. Our data is available publicly. I can't see it myself on my screen, and I'm looking for life expectancy. So when I show you life expectancy, it's going to change here. This is female life expectancy in the U.S., and you could see as we know in the South, life expectancy is lower. But I want to point to you like some places within the United States, within a state, as the gentleman was asking before, there is a huge disparity in life expectancy between counties within a state and within our country. So if you look within our country, we have 18 years gap of life expectancy. And this is widening. It has widened uh, in the U.S. It's not shrinking. So. People in the U.S., you have places, counties that live as, as much as a woman in Japan, and you have places in our country that women live here like what a woman live in sub-Saharan Africa. And if I look at the rate of change, and it's going to change here, and you could see in many counties, red color means you're going backward about four years. So as a country, we're increasing our life expectancy. It slowed down. But in many places in the country, they are left behind. And here, for example, in a darker place, let's say West Virginia, somewhere here in the south, you have a woman, if she is about 22 years old and having a daughter, her daughter has a life expectancy less than her. This is a not acceptable in the U.S. And I'll come back why this, why this happens, of course, is if you look at 
risk factors in the United States. And we have a huge variation. This is obesity change. This is the value of obesity right now. We have an epidemic of obesity, and you could see many women here, for example. This is still females. You have a high levels of obesity in, in the United States. So let me show you the other visualization about GBD, if this collaborates with me here. Okay. And I want to briefly do this and leave time for Derek to speak. So GBD, there's so many visualization. Everything I'm presenting is available on our web. It's, uh, we do it as a public good. So this is number of deaths in the world, and I'm trying to shift to 1990. And the point I want to make here, in 1990, there are about 12 million deaths under five. And you could see the deaths varies by age. You click on each one, it tells you how many people are dying from. So if I fast forward this to 2013 for you, what has happened, and I want deaths still, what has happened, we decreased the number of deaths under five. And this is the success of all pub public health programs, government investment from Doran businesses, where we focused on mortality. We decreased mortality by every age group in, in the world. And this is a great success story, where mortality is declining for everybody. Not the same rate. Many countries are still behind. But let me look at YLDs, and let me go now to, to, to 1990. And you could see in 1990, the majority of YLDs are coming from mental and substance abuse, musculoskeletal diseases. This is our back pain. That's what causes us disability, our neck pain. And if I shift it quickly from 1990 to 2013, not much a change in what's ailing us in the world. We have done a good job, everybody, as addressing what's killing us, especially childhood mortality. But we haven't done a, as good of a job in order to address what's really ailing us. And when, this is, of course, varies. This is at the globe. If I pick a country, a different country, that, that's totally different, of course, if I pick some country in Africa. But what I want briefly to show you here, if I go to risk factors and for DALIs, what's really causing these disparities in our country and everyone at the globe by country are these risk factors. High systolic blood pressure, smoking, body mass index, fasting glucose, wasting for some countries, alcohol use, indoor air exposure where poor women are cooking and <laughs> smelling whatever coal or wood they're using, our poor diet, and a lot of things. So what's really causing these disparities and what's really causing these except mental health are our risk factors. Let me go back to the presentation and sum up and end here. So what's really causing this are four, what we call them, four issues. Socioeconomic inequalities, poverty, education. And then education is very important, especially women education. So at the global level, what we see, a woman who's more educated is more likely to understand the danger of sign for herself and her child, more likely to seek medical care, more likely to be adhering to that medical care more likely to be delaying having kids because she's uh, getting her education. She's more likely to be in charge of finances. And we have to admit women do better than men, us, when it comes to finances in the house and controlling the spending. So that's the first one. The second one, which we debate a lot in the United States, is lack of access to health care. And that's not only having or not having an insurance. Sometimes we, people have insurance but doesn't qualify them to do preventive care, which is very important for us. Poor quality of care and not medical error here, we mean. It's timing from an event. I live in Seattle. I live next to a great medical school, medical hospitals. I have an insurance that gets me to that hospital. And it takes 15 minutes for an ambulance to drop me in that hospital if I have chest pain and a heart attack or signs of heart attack. That's not true for somebody who lives on the east side of Washington state because they don't have that great access to the hospital. And once I am in the medical care, am I being followed up properly? So medical care is bigger than only medical errors. But the biggest one that I want you to get out from my talk today are preventable causes of death. These are our risk factors. These are our smoking. 60% of premature deaths is caused by these risk factors, smoking, obesity. What we need to do, we need to focus on preventable risk factors. As great as it is to eliminate poverty and increase education, that's great. We're all supportive of it. But even from 
business mind, the best return on investment right now we could do is by addressing these risk factors, smoking, physical inactivity, diet, blood pressure, cholesterol. And giving this diversity of what we have at a workplace or at a community, there is no solution that will fit all. We have to accept that in the public health system that we cannot figure out a solution that will be applicable to every business or to every community or to every racial group or every in a country, every geographic area. So we have to experiment in funds. And public health is local, I agree with the last question that came here or the one before. Public health is local and we have to empower these local people to be able to find a solution for themselves and we have to pay for these innovations. And unless we do so, we're not succeeding. We need to stop funding programs that are not working and we need to reward those that are working. It's like businesses or, or me investing in my retirement in my 401k. If a stock is not doing well, it's sold and then you Somebody in for me is, I don't know how, but somebody is investing in the good stocks. And that's what we need to do here. Unless we have that mentality, and that's where businesses could help us with their view how to do this. The last thing that I want to end up uh, is, unless we in public health, I'm a public health person, worked for the US government, CDC for a long time, unless we involve the medical system in our prevention, it's not gonna work out. And unless we come back here, you hear our politicians, we have the best medical system in the world. True, for those who could access it, I gave you the story of Seattle and myself. But for many people, they don't have the access to that medical, great medical system. Then we have to change the way we look at a great medical system. So UW hospital, or medical hospital shouldn't be only judged by how it treats its patient, it should be also judged how its community and its catchment area is doing in terms of prevention. So we have to engage them and they have to be involved in. The last thing I want to show you, this day and age, we could see if we intervene what will happen. This is a publication in circulation that we published. This is cardiovascular disease mortality. It's coming down, not true for many countries in West Africa, but European, Western countries due to better medical treatment right now, the uptake of blood pressure and cholesterol medication. And if we forecast it, and that's what we're doing at IHME, we forecast where we are gonna be at 2040, and we take what if scenarios, the simulation, what if blood pressure declined by 25%, which is a goal for all of us in public health, you could see that's the uh, purple color that is declining that decline will keep continue, it will not level. Again, it's risk factors. Right now we could project it. We could project if we target a risk factor and reduce it, we could cost, look at the cost of that intervention and give you today through a simulation the cost effectiveness and we're doing this at IHME and we have a grant from Bill and Melinda Gates to do so. Thank you for everything. Thank you for being here and I wish you all the success in this very important meeting.